Okay, hi everyone, hello, welcome. I'm Lerna Ikmekçoğlu. I'm Macmillan Stewart Chair in History and Director of Women and Gender Studies Program. I convene these uh, once a semester talks on women in the developing world. It's my great honor to present today's speaker, Professor Elis Temerjian, my friend and colleague in the field of Ottoman, Armenian, and Genocide Studies. Dr. Semerjian is the new Robert Aram and Marianne Kalustian and Stefan and Marian Mugar Chair of Armenian Genocide Studies at the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. She will start her work at Clark next year, and we are very happy to welcome her to our academic community here in Boston. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the field, she replaced Taner Akcham's uh, position. I'm also grateful to Nas National Association of Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser, at Belmont, and its director, Mark Momigonian, who is here with us for co-sponsoring this talk which is being recorded and we'll upload it on the website. And I think we'll share with Nasser. If, okay. We, we totally forget about this. Uh, asking the permission to Nasser if they would, they would like it. Uh, so I'm going to quickly introduce Dr. Samarjan and then we will uh, get the program going. Dr. Samarjan is a social historian of the Ottoman Empire whose research focuses on the experiences of women and the empire's Armenian subjects. Her first book, published in 2008 by Syracuse University Press, is titled Off the Straight Path, Illicit Sex, Law, and Community in Ottoman Aleppo. It's a fascinating study of how the treatment of illicit sex evolved under Islamic law, specifically explored in the context of Ottoman Aleppo. Among the many articles that are standard reading for so many of us who teach, who study or teach the uh, gender and the Middle East, I will mention only one, what we usually refer to as Elise's Hammam article. It's titled Naked Anxiety, Bathhouses, Nudity, and the Dimmi Woman in 18th Century Aleppo. I'm not exaggerating when I say that I get an intellectual high every time I read or teach this piece, which is all about how the intersection of being an ethnic minority or the non-dominant group member and womanhood in 18th century Ottoman Aleppo intersected when co-confessional bathing was prohibited for the first time by the government and by the uh, leaders of the communities because the Dimmi woman's gaze was gendered male and therefore forbidden to touch the body of a Muslim woman. But we are here today to listen to Dr. Semerjian on her most recent work. She made a shift towards more modern uh, history and also, uh, well, no, still regionally the Middle East, but other parts of the empire, including outside of the uh, sea of, of Ottoman Syria. I have the book here, whoever is interested in seeing it. Anyways, it's somewhere there. It's titled Remnants, Embodied Archives of the Armenian Genocide, published by Stanford Press, Stanford University Press in 2023. It's the first comprehensive book that offers a feminist reading of the Armenian genocide. It explores how the Ottoman Armenian communal body was dismembered, disfigured, and later remembered of, by the survivor community. As I wrote in my endorsement in the back of the volume, Remnants is the book we have all been waiting for. Breathtaking plot, methodological novelty without any accompanying concise, theoretically and factually grounded. And it is my immense pleasure as someone who is in the subfield specifically, which is a very small field, uh, to welcome Elise to this podium to deliver her talk title here. Thank you. Is just a question. Do I hold this while I'm speaking? Is that how yes. I should be too? Okay. Alrighty. Um, I want to thank Lerna for having me here today. Um, this is my first time at MIT, and I'm also glad that this is my induction into 
um, the academic community here in the greater Boston area. I really plan on collaborating with you all, and I'm excited about that. I also want to thank Nasser for uh, co-sponsoring, uh, Mark Mamagonian and Nasser for co-sponsoring the talk today. Um, it's exciting to be um, part of the Macmillan Stewart series, which is also um, Lerna's position, named position at, at um, MIT. Um, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you about something, you know, quite grim, but um, I, I'll try to keep it lively, even though it is a dark material. Um, I'm going to talk about my book, Remnants, Embodied Archives of the Armenian Genocide, but I really want to focus a little bit more on some sources to talk about the methodology of sifting through remnants. Um, in the book, I explore how gender and the body figured centrally in the minds of not only perpetrators, but within the minds of humanitarians who rescued and recuperated Armenian victims, predominantly women and children. The through line of the book examines post-memory of the Armenian genocide and how the uprooting of the Ottoman Empire's Armenian population from their ancestral homelands in Anatolia, or what is today modern Turkey, is remembered as body horror. Uh, the memory of dismemberment, tattooed skin, and bones of martyrs. Remnants uh, analyzes fragmentary evidence of Armenian survivors paying special attention to the traces violence has left on the body of the archive and the actual bodies of Armenian victims and their descendants. The embodied trauma of victims of sexual abuse and forced marriage have at times been deemed too personal or too emotional to be worthy of historical study. They're just emotional memories. Born out of a frustration with what traditional archives could not reveal, I argue that women's bodies are historical evidence worthy of study. And to locate these bodies, I engage in a number of interdisciplinary fields while reading memoirs, letters, newspaper clippings, biographies, oral histories. I dabble in ethnography, which is another field, um, maybe even in some ways that are upsetting to historians, but I'm willing to take that risk. Um, I analyze photography and film across a dozen archives and in seven languages. Some of the languages I don't know, so um, I did have a historian, Matthias Bjornland, helped me with the Danish archives, for example. So the breakdown of the book, just to give you a, sort of the overall arching framework before I dive into some, um, <clears throat> some specific examples. Um, I, the, body, the body is the first, the first part of the book is focused on the body, which is really about body horror, um, re memories of dismemberment, um, it really analyzing things like nudity and shame um, that I felt had been uh, not deeply analyzed in the field. Um, to understand how that also translates into part two, which is on skin. And I could have focused on wounds, um, for example, that could have been one angle. But I felt like in Armenian post-memory, we really needed to look at tattooed skin because it is such a dominant image. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And especially tattooing uh, that happened for women who were Islamized, ch women and children Islamized in, in, in Muslim homes where tattooing was practiced. Um, I wanted to also understand the motivations of tattooing, for example. Um, bones is part three, and that is really about the bones of martyrs. And I found myself coming to the conclusion wanting to look at what remains 100 years later, which is the remnants of bodies and why it is that Armenian post-memory practices figure heavily into collecting bones in the area of Deir Azur, a practice that's not happening now. I can talk more about why. Um, in the Q&A, but I tried to reconstruct about a century of writing, interaction, photography um, in Deir Azur to look at how Armenians were writing about their experiences in the desert. And so I come to this idea of post-memory, and of course, the touchstone here for post-memory is Holocaust studies, thinking about Marianne Hirsch and Leo Spitzer, who explain of Jewish post-memory of the Holocaust um, quote, these events, events of the Holocaust, were transmitted to them so deeply and affectively so as to seem to constitute memories in their own right. Post-memory's connection to the past is thus mediated, not by recall, but by imaginative investment, projection, and creation. And so this critical view towards post-memory means we're not just extracting information about the past. I mean, we get important information about the past in post-memory, but a lot of times we also get 
the experience of survivor communities, and here I'm talking about multiple generations after the event, who sometimes feel that they themselves have experienced what their grandparents went through. And that I found very interesting. Um, the passage really gives us the idea of how post-memory, a memory of the past, can form a personal recollection for those who did not directly experience genocidal trauma. And we also know through psychological studies now that um, epigenetic trauma is real, it's documented, um, that's registered in the body. It's not, um, it's not also just something that's from pure imagination. For Armenians, I address post-memory in three respects, the memory of dismemberment, the memory of tattooed skin, and these memorial practices that take place around bones. And I think what's really important about this post-memory example here with Susan, Susan Khardalian's 2011 Grandma's Tattoos documentary that aired on Al Jazeera is that she actually juxtaposes tattooed grandmother with Khardalian herself handling and fondling bones in Deir Zor. So she is juxtaposing, actually, in her own film, the tattoos with the remnants. And I got to interview her, and I, f I felt like the interview with Suzanne Khardalian really helped me understand post-memory uh, more deeply than even beyond the film, uh, in that sense. I call po this post-memory prosthetic memory in order to get us back to the idea that this is embodied memory. And it's also tied to ritual practices that are also embodied. Thinking about pre-modern history, especially among Christian communities, where the Eucharist or self-flagellation, fasting for Vespers, fasting for Easter, as we think of that, uh, the Lenten fast, and pilgrimage was also embodied arduous labor, right? And so these are not embodied acts of memory. They temporally situate memories of Christ's suffering and you, they're reenacted by the community. Um, and so I think about that, but I also think about the space of radical possibility when we think about the memory acts that were taking place in Deir Zor before the Syrian war. Um, and then also um, sifting through some of these images, including critically, including grandma's tattoos to talk and inter interrogate really this um, power of images to haunt us the way they do. And so this comes back to a part of my title where I talk about a mutilated archive. I just wanted to mention where I'm getting that from. I'm taking a lot of cues from feminist writers, and I seek to reclaim this concept of remnants as a tool of resistance against post-genocide aphasia. And here it means locating women's bodies, women and the bodies of women and girls that have miraculously survived um, what Marissa Fuentes has called in her 2016 study, the mutilated historicity. Um, she was studying the, the experiences of slave women. And in that way, the archive is a, a very much a parallel in the sense that locating women's lived experience is challenging, especially when we talk about everyday experiences, which is of course, what I strive for as a social historian. Thank you. Fuentes uh, documents. Does this work? Okay. Fuentes documents the undocument, the undocumentability. Um, and instead of working to restore wholeness, she is really honing in on those archival traces of women's lives without actually trying to even argue for agency, which is difficult. And so it's within the mutilated archive that, that, that remains after slavery, or in the case, the Armenian genocide, where there was both a mix of slavery and genocide, that tattooed and scarred bearing women... Um, where tattooed and scarred bearing women um, can be located. Um, and perhaps some of the findings might be not be very um, satisfying. Sorry, I just lost uh, some of my notes. I'm gonna move on here. And because not everybody may have the same background, I'm gonna give a very quick uh, sort of chronology. Um, and here, my chronology is really just focused on thinking about bodies, disappearing bodies, and like also um, the transfer of bodies or traffic in women and children, as it was called in the League, League of Nations parlance. But here we have the conscription and disappearance of men during World War I becomes a cr critical moment for the Armenian community where the, the population is gradually more feminized, el more older, and also more feminized. Um, and I do want to mention what's not on my slide is the targeting of the Greek community, which pre predated 
um, the events of, of 1915, because that starts in 1914. Um, by April 24th, we have um, a moment in which the intellectuals' leadership classes are arrested and disappeared. Um, and April 24th, 1915, of course, becomes the date where Armenians uh, commemorate the Armenian Genocide, so that's coming up in a few weeks. On May 27th, we have the Relocation and Resettlement Law, which forcibly deports populations from their villages and towns and cities. However, uh, we know from firsthand testimony and eyewitness accounts that many people did not even uh, exit their towns before they were murdered. We also, uh, historians have argued, um, you know, that relocation, of course, is code for murder. Um, we have, along the way, and these those who did enter the caravan routes, a very feminine, feminized caravan, that is, um, endured abduction, forced conversion, marriage and concubinage, slavery, and then also for women and children became domestic labor inside um, the homes they were taken to. We do know that there are some cases of adoption. No two people's uh, experiences are the same. Some memoirs describe being adopted by the family and some people describe a state of servitude um, that in some cases when you read the League of Nations documents you can read about deformities of the back uh, that some children had from severe beatings. Uh, Karen Yape once said uh, of one child, he got more beating than eating uh, in a kind of, a, kind of poem that she wrote in her, her notes on a record. Um, so it's in this context we know some Armenian women received tattoos, not all did, um, but the tattoos become this kind of enduring uh, sort of visual uh, legacy of, of, of this period of forced conversion and concubinage, et cetera. Um, rescue and recuperation, these efforts, I, I tried to, taking some cues from also uh, Khachik Moradian, who has talked about um, the rescue efforts of the Armenians in his recent book. The archives are very clear that Armenians were mobilized to rescue themselves during the Armenian Genocide. Um, and then also from Lerna's book, uh, Recovering Armenia, we get this uh, efforts of Armenians to reconstitute themselves and to recover and recuperate those women, um, to, to um, develop the Armenian community after uh, a severe loss of nearly a million people. Um, and so it's through, really through the lens of gender and genocide that I analyze for the first few p chapters some pretty disturbing information about um, the nature of this uh, sort of gendered violence against women um, and children um, in the caravans. And I argue that children were, uh, especially prepubescent children, were not yet men. And so they were in this kind of feminized liminal area um, that, uh, you know, kind of afforded them some survival. Um, Claudia Card talks about gender and genocide as something, you know, genocide targeting social vitality as a way of talking about um, the kind of expunging of the capacity of a community to be vital or survivable. Um, I find also very compelling Elisa van Hoden Forgery's um, theorization of gender and, and genocide, where she talks about how genocide targets the womb, it targets life for force itself. And so when she describes genocide as life, life force atrocity, I think it becomes a lens through which we can understand how demography, um, biopolitics, and necropolitics are all centered on population growth and stymieing that growth at all costs. And so this is a general map of some of the zones. It's not a comprehensive zone. I did focus more on Syria because my histories have long been focused on Syria, Aleppo, which was one of the gathering points for deportation. And then deportees were again deported to Raqqa and then to Deir Zor. And then around 1916, we have more deportations northward along the Khabur River. And on the Khabur River is where we have some mass grave sites that were long um, visited by Armenians um, over the, the century. And so I want to start with the first part of bodies just to give you an example of some of my interventions. I, I have used Ottoman sources in the past, but I decided to not overly fetishize them in this work, and there's a reason. Um, if we want to talk about mutilated archive, I want to give you a sense 
of what one looks like. And there are a series of documents that after the armistice, after World War I, again, really recalling Lerna's work on Armenian recovery efforts in Constantinople and Istanbul, we have a series of records from different parts of the empire. This one is from Sivas. And we have uh, sometimes family members and sometimes individual women who are trying to get out of their situation of captivity by using the system that the state itself has created. So you can imagine what they're up against. Um, they're up against the violence of the state, the post-genocidal state, trying to um, release themselves from these homes. And so here's, a, here's a, such a complaint. It's unresolved, so I really don't know what happens, but it is a trace. You can think of it as a fingerprint or a, a reverse negative of a woman um, inside one of these homes. It's understood from the complaint that the gendarme company captain, Niazi Effendi, took an Armenian girl who's unnamed as a bride for himself by force during the relocation. So here is a woman who was pecked off from the caravan during the deportations. This is what she looks like inside the, the state archive. And then it continues above the unnamed Armenian girl not being content with the above mentioned person, nowadays wishes to go to her mother's household despite not daring to do so. So she wants to be released. She's been married by force, and we could talk about legally whether any woman should be married by force. Um, there are debates about that in Islamic law. But she wants to be released, but can't. In some cases, I have another case in which um, Armenian men went to the door, because after the armistice, these women were to be released from those homes. They knocked on the door and then punched the man who opened it in the face to try to retrieve uh, a woman from the household. So there were cases of that, I mean, where people took the matters in their own hands, and other matters they tried to use um, you know, state uh, institutions to do so. But I think it's very important to also recognize that you know this woman who's at the center of this case is not even named. And so what do we do? How do we name these women? How do we put a face to them? And this is a letter. Um, it was archived in a sort of haphazard way because Rupan Haryan, who was an Armenian American, uh, went and he began rescuing Armenians in and around Deir Azor, um, during, um, during the genocide and, and afterward, um, he decided to volunteer actually um, for the French Legion. He was rejected. Uh, and so he spent his time recovering women and children in Eastern Syria. And he kept everything he was given, um, little scraps of paper. Um, I learned about him through Anna Alexandian, who's been working on him. And his archive is incredible, but it's located in Yerevan. Um, but here is a letter from a captive woman, and she writes, Dear Father, I was very happy to receive your letter. Praise the Lord. Through his infinite favor, he rescued us from our enemies. Father, when I was made aware that you were alive, I felt so happy. I wish I had the wings of a bird to fly and come to you. It's, it's very poetic. And then she says, I have two children here. One is Nazareth, which is from her Armenian husband before the war, and the other from the Arab, who's here he's unnamed. The Arab is unnamed. Okay. And when I received your letter, I wanted to come to Aleppo, but my son's father is not here, and I have no money, so I beg my father to free me from this Arab. Go to the church and beg. The church was organizing some of these efforts with Haryan and with many other uh, research teams, uh, or rescue teams, excuse me. Um, and she, she begs um, for him to free her from here. Karanush Kyumjian Raqqa. Um, so we don't know the resolution of this case. Sometimes Harian would make a note on the back side of it. But we learn information that this particular Arab who she's living with, who may be a, a marriage, like there may be a marriage, or maybe she is in an unmarried relationship with him, um, that she has a son, another child from him, and that she's also able to communicate with her father, which I think is really important. Uh, Armenians were smuggling letters and transferring them to each other. To think that there was this clandestine communication in a difficult circumstance is quite remarkable. Um, sometimes these letters were transferred by children with whom the women could be in contact with without raising suspicion. Sometimes muleteers were transferring people and letters. So boys riding mules were like underlying heroes of our story too that um, I think are quite remarkable. Um, but here we really get a, a voice of a woman from beyond and it's, it's quite, for me it was like the most remarkable find. Um, 
I had a lot of questions about skin, and um, just a few of them are, how did the skin, the tattooed skin of rescued Armenian women and girls communicate both belongingness and otherness within the communities that they came in contact with? I mean, how did those tattoos communicate belongingness, for example, within the, the tribal, often Bedouin, rural communities they lived in? How did they come to communicate otherness among Armenians or even produce feelings of abjection? So here we have feelings of ob objection and shame uh, that tattooed bearing sur survivors uh, experienced, especially after reunification with the Armenian community. And um, how, how have the tattoos that some Arme women survivors bore as a result of trafficking come to signify the shame of Islamization and cultural genocide in Armenian post-memory? Those are some of the questions that I had after reading, uh, watching, excuse me, Suzanne Khardalian's film, Grandma's Tattoos. And so it kind of brings me to my cover. It's actually a cropped photograph of an actual intake record from Karen Yape's League of Nations run uh, rescue home in Aleppo, Syria. And um, Lutfi actually, she stands out to me. Um, well, first, she's 17 years old. We learned some basic data about her on the top of the intake record. But then we um, learn even more information in the body. And this was either composed by Karen Yape or her assistant, um, Leo Gasich. Um, who, who did all the intakes. And then we have a photograph affixed to the upper right corner. So some of them are gone through, through time. They've, they've come unglued and maybe disappeared. But for the most part, each individual got an oval-shaped portrait, kind of humanizing them in some way. Um, and here we learn that she was deported from Ain Tab, um, that she ended up in Meskene, where there were Armenian refugee camps, uh, if you can even call them that, concentration camps ad hoc concentration camps. She ends up in Derzor, and this is where her mother is killed while defending her children. And two of her brothers are, are murdered. And then she's taken by a Chechen, and there she's transferred three times over to a Chechen, to a Kurd, and ultimately to a, a Turk who lived in Viran Shahir, which is not close by. Um, ultimately, she decided to flee where she was and go to Ras Alain. And that is where she was rescued. So let's take a, a, a look at the photograph because I wanted to see if there was more information than what was in the written record. And of course, her tattoos are very prominent, but that allows me to interpret them over time. And there's been tattoo anthropology for Eastern Syria and a lot written inside Turkey, mostly in Turkish, because tattoos are increasingly viewed as a kind of intangible uh, Kurdish cultural heritage. So there's a lot of interest in documenting these tattoos. So one of the things I see, I have a, a whole interpretation of her dress because a lot of people showed up wearing you know, ter torn dresses or even um, clothes that were not proper clothes um, by the time they arrived in Aleppo, but she's impeccably dressed uh, compared to her cohort uh, with a carved you know, rooster belt buckle there's a lot of care in her appearance, and she's looking, you know, from what I can see, directly into the gaze of the camera. She doesn't seem to be recoiling as some people did when they were photographed. Um, to move to her tattoos, though, um, now one tattoo anthropologist who worked in, in Der Azur area before the war um, was able to confirm for me that there are three parts of her tattoos on her face. There's the three dots on her left cheek, the dot on her nose, and the line or siala, which is right here on her chin. And those together are the insignia of the Anaza tribe. So what we learn by analyzing the photograph more deeply is who applied those tattoos and perhaps the first group of people she was with. There's part of the story that's not written but is inscribed on her body. And I'm very interested also in how the dots on her cheek and even on her forehead are mimicking what's on her dress in a way complementing each other. It doesn't register as someone who seems particularly shameful, but we do know that it's at the point of reabsorption into the Armenian community, the fact that women were wearing these marks on their face that marked them as belonging to another community that shame set in. And that's where I come to Aravni Kabakian, whose story I can't share in its entirety, but she uh, penned two very short um, memoirs. It might have been you, Mark, that helped me get these short memoir pieces in your archives at Nasser. Um, she talked very 
uh, explicitly about when she was tattooed by a Roma. She called them Roma, perhaps they were Bedouin, but she called them a Roma community that adopted her in Al-Bab outside of Aleppo. And um, she had a horrific experience with them. She was sexually assaulted. And soon after the sexual assault, and it, I would say the sexual assault and the tattoo assault are so similar to each other that actually um, you, the tattoo, I began to write and at the point of writing the book, calling it a tattoo rape because it was such a violent moment of tattooing on her face, her being held down and, uh, by, by women and tattooed. Um, well, what, what is important about you know, Aravni, I think a few things. I mean, she felt so stigmatized when she arrived in Constantinople and began studying nursing that she wanted her tattoos removed and she eventually found a, a, a doctor who was trained at Princeton University, named William Post, removed her tattoos. Um, and she was thankful to have the scars. In fact, her immigration record to the United States pointed out the scars on her face, which was where the tattoos had been cut out uh, in the procedure. So I have a lot more to say about her, but I would just say uh, the tattoos are a, a memory of sexual trauma, of um, a violent violation of her body and on two, two different levels. And as she said in this quote, um, I was one of those little Armenian girls with rosy cheeks who had carved on her forehead the entire tragedy of her race, which is like jagadakir, is what she's sort of describing this Armenian concept of having your fate written on your forehead. We have different images. I have to move by that one because I, I don't have permission to show it, unfortunately. I was supposed to eliminate it. Getty is very protective of their visual material. Um, I'll move to this. Um, this is an image of what could have been one of the first tattoo removal surgeries. This was in Aleppo at the Karanya Pei compound. And here is a very similar procedure that I think Aravni had received, which is the cutting out of the tattoos from the face. Um, we know that during this period of recuperation, attempt to re, uh, reassimilate into the Armenian community, um, having these tattoos removed was very important for some women. Um, and so I raise a lot of questions about why, what is the significance of the tattoo, and also the long history of especially Western discourse about tattoos that I think were absorbed by the Armenian community. Um, we know that Armenians have described them as Turkish symbols, but they are not Turkish. I mean, in fact, there's a huge um, puzzle about whether Turks ever tattooed. Um, it's mostly Kurdish and Arab communities uh, that were tattooing. And then also the idea that they might be religious or actually symbolic of Islamization is also something that I, I was not able to resolve because the symbols seem much more ancient. A lot of them are fertility symbols, um, symbols from nature, like wheat chaff, symbols related to work, like the tarak or the comb, which is related to weaving. Um, and many of them are meant to be protective amulets and blessings. And then of course, if we think back to Lutfi's face, symbolic of her tribal, her belonging to a particular tribal community, territorializing her body in this way. Bones, I won't say a whole lot about, um, but I, it is the third part of the book. It's, um, you know, and it, I, I wanted to just at least introduce it to you and invite you to read it about this kind of history of Armenian writing and interaction with the killing fields in, in Syria. Um, when we think about memorial, we do think about the Armenian Genocide Memorial in Tzatanerka Tzat Bert in, in uh, Yerevan, and this uh, state memorial where Armenians on April 24th climb um, to the site. It's very arduous, you know, kind of getting back to pilgrimage, being an embodied process. But, you know, there's a different kind of pilgrimage taking place in Syria. It's, it's in sharp contrast to this one. And so how, are, how do Armenians cope with the psychic pressure to mourn the dead who have no headstones, no gravestones? How do Armenians feel their way through the desert in an unmarked necrogeography? I mean, I asked Suzanne Khardalian, how did you make your way through, through Deir Zor? And she said, every Armenian carries a map inside them. I thought that was really um, amazing because it kind of gets us back to the idea of an embodied memory. But of course, I document all the Arabs who also helped Armenians find their way and, and helped them find their way to mass grave sites where they sometimes together dug up bones. Um, I use some various theories, which includes uh, the idea, it's sort of the counterpoint to Pierre Nora's site of memory concept, but sites 
uh, non-sites of memory are spaces where that are unmarked spaces. And Romy Sendaika at Harvard has actually looked at um, people who experience the uncanny when they visit places of mass atrocity during the Holocaust, during the Shoah. Hi. Um, so uh, she talks about experiences of the uncanny when people who visit places in Poland that are completely unmarked but where mass amount of Jews perished um, during the Holocaust. Um, people feel ill, unsettled. And there's certainly that going on with Derezor. It, it had some markings before the war. All the markings are gone now in Derezor. But uh, some people felt uneasy or physically ill when they went there. Um, so non-sites of memory are very different than a major state memorial. Um, bone memory is one way that I, I theorize this urge to collect bones to remember or reassemble in this kind of symbolic way the Armenian community that is fragmented. Um, and you can see that in various mourning rituals that I trace. Uh, what I wanted to do is show you a few images just to give you a sense of this long tradition of writing. Um, I, the first piece I came across was actually um, uh, Hamastex with a skull. Uh, it's a, an essay where he's actually recounting his visit to Deir Azur. Um, apparently, he collected a skull while he was there. Um, I did go to some museums to see if I could find the skull he had collected, but I couldn't. Um, but in, in the essay, he actually, the, the skull is a muse that sort of inspires him to write. It converses with him. It's animated again. The skull is his friend, his companion. And then he keeps uttering this refrain, if I only knew the name of that skull, if I only knew the name of that skull, the desire to name, to sort of give a name to those bones, like results in him projecting different persona onto the skull. And in his case, there's three different persona. All of them are men of the cloth. All of them are priests. And at one point, the skull becomes a chalice, and it becomes part of the Eucharist. It's, it's, it's an incredible piece of writing that truly reflects prosthetic memory how it is, or bone memory, I'll say here, how the bones are actually um, inviting um, Armenian writers and participants in these dark pilgrimages to Deir to to envision uh, really the fleshiness that once clothed those bones. It's an incredible essay. And um, Bahan Papazian, we have an iconic, you know, a few iconic photographs. I'm only showing you this one. It was taken by a very famous um, Norwegian, uh, humanitarian Catherine Bodil Bjorn. But he's looking upon the bones almost like modeling for us how it is that we witness in, in the killing fields. And whether or not like this femur, I think that might be a femur sticking out of the ground, whether or not that's staged or not, I can't say, but I feel like there's something iconic about this photograph. He's, he's, he's modeling for us how it is that we witness Der Zor. And it also gives us an idea of just how unmarked the space is. And there's so much of this. We have all kinds of writings in Armenian journals, um, you know, throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s. It, it, it itself could be a, its own project. In fact, at one point, I did think maybe it should be separated. But I do think it's connected. Um, the idea of like the uh, witnessing the martyrdom in Der Zor, I do think is connected to the kind of uh, witnessing that we have through the photography of tattooed women. They too are martyrs, in this case, ethno-martyrs, uh, women who are lost to the community because they've been culturally assimilated. Um, and so I will show just a couple more small examples before I wrap up. Um, and this is just a small taste. I, I know it's abbreviated, but I wanted to give you an, a, an example of how women also gender the bones when they're in Derezor. And I came across the writing of Nora Persikian, who's a contemporary, she's a journalist and an editor at Astak in, in um, Beirut. And she wrote this piece, Melodies from the Euphrates, which was inspired by her own trip to Derezor with a, a women's group. And um, she went to the old Derezor bridge, and this is an image of it. Uh, there was a suspension, if you know Der Zor well, you'll know there was a suspension bridge there, but that was destroyed during the fighting in the war. This is the bridge that predated it, so likely this could, could have been the bridge that was there during the Armenian genocide. 
Um, and what she imagined, well, what I want to say what she remembered <laughs> through prosthetic memory was um, women and girls uh, flinging themselves from this bridge during the Armenian Genocide, and many people carry this kind of memory with them. Girls and women, three or four hundred in number, untied their belts, fastened themselves together, and one after the other jumped into the Euphrates River in order to not fall into the Turks' hands. The current of the river could not be seen then. The corpses had risen to the surface and were piled up one upon the other like a fortress. And so she has actually two essays that I analyze, um, only because a, a lot of the writing was done by men and I wanted to include some gendered imagery so that we could see the way that the patina of the bones is sort of inviting people to project themselves, in fact, onto it. Um, because if anything, I see you know, post-memory and prosthetic memory is very much related um, to the self. Um, and I wanted to, in order for, for transparency, um, talk about how not all of Deir Zor was unmarked in 1990. Uh, the uh, Armenian um, uh, prelate, prelate in Aleppo uh, decided to create two monuments. One was in Mergada, which is about 70 kilometers north of Deir Zor, along the Khabur. It was one of the deportation routes, and many Armenians perished in Mergada, so they built a chapel, a memorial chapel there. But here in Deir Zor, there was the Holy Martyrs Church, an Armenian genocide memorial, and it was... Um, where Armenians from mostly Lebanon and Syria on April 24th would go, visit and return home on the same day, almost never staying overnight because it is a haunted place for Armenians. So staying overnight was rare to find in the people I interviewed. Um, but I got a sense of some of the ceremonies that took place there. And many of you might know that this was a place that was also bombed in 2014 during the fighting. Um, and there there has been discussion and effort um, to uh, think about rebuilding the site. However, um, a team of people went, it was two years ago, three years ago now, um, went to the site and actually there are sleeper cells everywhere in Deir Zor. And so that a team of people who came from actually Hasake and, went and came down south to Deir Zor were actually gunned down and killed. Um, so there's, there's probably not going to be a memorial there anytime soon. Both of the memorials, the one at Margada and the one at Deir Zor, are no longer existent. Um, so that really leaves us open with possibilities for the future and what memorial will look like moving into the future. Um, I really tried to leave the reader with some possibilities of a living human archive with an idea of knowing in the bones, which can serve as an antidote to maybe not having a memorial to maybe not having a state uh, that cares about this. Um, in the case of Syria, Syria was not involved actually in the building of this memorial at all. We also have the problem of the state archives and that sort of erasure of mass violence in, in the archives. And again, I just, my hope is that by sharing these stories could really prompt us to think more deeply also about the gendered nature of genocidal violence as a form of body horror and how it continues to figure into Armenian post-memory. Bones are powerful agents of memory that have for centuries prompted communities to ceremonially remember the dead as an extension of the living Armenian community. Thinking through bones and what I call bone memory can help us understand our human urge to interact with the dead in our memory practices and why the body horror of the past weighs still so heavily on the minds of Armenians a century after. Thank you. Yes, now it's time for questions. Um, we have about half an hour, 25 minutes to half an hour. And I'll go around if um, you raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, Manu Caprillion from Providence, Rhode Island. If you want the pictures of the Syrian church as it remained before it was rebuilt and then again destroyed, uh, my best friend, uh, Bej Zorbian, who's Syrian born, went mm -hmm. there and it was like time stopped. You can see the altar. So we'll stay in touch and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get uh, those pictures to you to complete uh, what you, and illustrate what you have. 
Um, is anybody else? Hi, my name is Puya. I'm from the history department. I teach Middle East history here. Um, I, I first I have a comment and two really basic questions. Yeah. Uh, my first comment is really, I I can't imagine how difficult this was for you. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do is deeply personal. This seems like it's deeply personal on another level. And just being here was emotionally exhausting. And I can't imagine how difficult it was for you to do this for so many years and bear the weight of the past hundred years on your shoulders. And just want to acknowledge that I think you you did your people very proud. I'm not used to this kind of generosity from fellow academics. That is so incredible. I don't mean to really, but seriously, that's, that's the kindest com a comment I've ever received. Thank you. Do you want me? I, I um, You know, uh, it, I'm an Armenian, but I'm also, I have many identities. I, you, know, I've, you know, I'm American, but I, I'm also a Lepin, and it's been a really hard decade. Um, you know, quite literally not being able to even return to Syria has been really hard. I know people in the audience, I mean, even Lerna was mentioning my work has always been centered on Aleppo, trying to go to Aleppo at every turn, and I've been gone for 14 years now. Um, and so I think actually it was the Syrian war that, if you think of memory as sediment, that got kicked up. There's all these layers, and the first layer that got kicked up for me was losing Aleppo and access to it, not seeing my family, you know, because none of my family left Aleppo. My father was the only mm. one. So there's that. And then there, the second part um, was how kicking up that sediment, it also, my, for my father at one point, he said, you remember when, when the French left, your grandfather was terrified. He had his gun from when he was, you know, a farm boy and then, in the uh, Aitab, and he went and dug it up from the courtyard to get ready to defend himself, but the gun disintegrated in his hands. Mm. It was so old. Um, so, you know, thinking about my father's memories being, you know, of in instability, um, somehow is, it, it, it kicks up the sediment of memory. And, and then I felt like I had to start at the beginning which was, who are my grandparents? If you read my book, I actually don't even know anything. And so how can I be a historian and not even know my great-grandparents' names? I, I know very little compared to other people. I'm envious of those who have a genealogy. So that's, I think that's where it started, but thank you for that. I'm so glad you just brought up genealogy. Uh, tomorrow evening I'm having dinner with two Turkish professors, one from RISD's an Academy Award nominee, uh, animator and a history professor that I met at Brown. And they both have Armenian grandparents that they love. Mm -hmm. But the, you said specifically it was the Kurds that designated with tattoos the tribes uh, from the uh, families, uh, 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 the tribes that they were taken in by. And I was with, at a lecture last night and uh, uh, and uh, the gentleman there said, every Kurd he's met has an Armenian woman in mm -hmm. the, their life. Yeah. And I was just wondering about uh, what we may discover uh, through their histories, because I have somebody coming in from Chicago to have dinner, and she works on helping people do their grandmother's story. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we talk to Kurds. I think it's really important that we share stories with each other. I've done some of that work in Turkey, and that also, I think, helped me get to a place where I could think about this. Um, I mean, because, again, I mean, the Kurdish community has done so much to actually think through critically what's happened in the past 100 years, and, and now they're experiencing state terror of their own. Um, so I'm definitely part of the group of others in this audience that, you know, believe we need to be in conversation with one another, and um, and that's that's actually the stepping stone, hopefully, towards something much greater. I hope. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. Um, the questions they're very basic. Um, one was I forgot her name, but um, 
she had her scars removed. Uh, I'm sorry, her tattoos removed. And you yeah. said that she was she proudly wore her scars. And was that? Uh, I just wanted to know why was she proud of that? It was that was was she proud because it was a measure of correcting this injustice on a, on a, like a superficial mm-hmm. level. Um, and also, this is even more. This is way more basic. The the um, the lady from Raqqa, uh, mm-hmm. how she. Um, referred to her her firstborn from her Armenian partner as Nazareth. Mm-hmm. Can is that the name or what does that mean? Because yeah, the, the the son from the Arab um man didn't have a name. And yeah. I was wondering does does Nazareth have a meaning or was that the name? No, that's I, that's a common name. Um so Nazareth is the name. But that's really uh that was something maybe I should have paused on and said, isn't it interesting who's unnamed in each document? Um, because that that offspring will never be hers. In fact, Karen Yopay at the rescue home, if she indeed fled, she theoretically should have left that child behind. So that was extremely painful. Mothers had children with Arabs, Kurds, Turks, and had to theoretically leave them behind. A few came through and got through the cracks, um, but for the most part, they were not supposed to go with the mother. They belonged to the father. So I think there's a strong reference to the kind of pa- patrimony and patriarchal uh, lineage there. Um, is it possible that she didn't name that child because she knew she might have to give it up? Um, I'm not sure. Sh- the second I, child? I, I mean, it, perhaps I... I I, I would have to like look into like more of like Raqqa, what their local traditions are, but usually kids get names in the first few weeks. If it's an infant, perhaps, no, just yeah. just in the document to her father. Yeah, perhaps. yeah, That's perhaps. Okay. The, first question. the scars, uh, the scars yes. Uh, her name's Agavni, and, um, and you know, her, she approached an Armenian surgeon first in Constantinople to ask if he would remove her tattoos, and he said, no, these are badges of va- valor. Badge, these are... Uh, you know, you're you're a hero to survive this, and he did not want to scar her face. But when uh, William Post came from the United States, he was the head of the medical mission for Near East Relief. He came to Constantinople, and I should mention, Agavni trained as a nurse under Mabel Elliott, and Mabel Elliott had very negative things to say about tattooed women. She believed that these were horrible slave markings that, you know, branded these women as slaves. So she used the slave branding rhetoric. So Agavni was feel, definitely feeling stigmatized about her tattoos. I can't help but think her proximity to Mabel Elliott mattered. Um, she, he, you know, there was fear about scar- scarring her face, but yes, she she preferred the scars to the to the tattoos. And um, and it tells you like the lengths to which, you know, she was willing to go. Yeah. Here. So yeah, I wanted to. Uh, my name is Arik Danagulian. I'm from. Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering here. So I would, like, I would like to look at this question of tattooing from the point of view of people who did the tattooing. Yeah. Right? So clearly these Kur- people in these Kurdish tribes put these tattoos on each other, mm-hmm. right? As an essentially as a form of identification, like, yeah. like we have last names to identify mm-hmm. ourselves, our tribe or things like that. So if you are bringing someone into your tribe and you think of them as a slave, would you put your identity on that person's face? You would not. So if you put your identity on that person's face, you probably see that person as an equal within the at least limits of equality that could exist in that tribe, right? Yeah, I mean, that's why we're able to decipher some of these over time is because um, because, because the other communities are still wearing them. Those who do tattoo, and there, there are fewer women today, that's another story, but it is a disappearing practice, which is why there's some urgency to document it. But... It's the same exact motifs, the same um, designs are being used today. So yes, would it be a slave branding? I mean, I, this is where I disagree with aspects of what's circulating in the Armenian community, which is, and you know, Amy Singer is here, and we know that Ottomans did not brand their slaves. Um, it's not something regional. It's actually branding slaves. That is something that happened in the United States. So that's actually an Armenian uh, American memory that somehow permeated uh, Armenian post memory. So it's important that these are indeed the tattoos of belonging to that community that other women and some men actually had them as well. I spent some time in Paris as a kid, and there were lots of North African women mm-hmm. from Algeria and Morocco 
many of them had tattoos. And yeah. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like very surprised. They are different though. Um, yeah. Lars Krutak, who's a tattoo anthropo tattoo hunter, I think he calls himself. He's a tattoo, he's a tattoo anthropologist. He he's documented North African tattoos, and some others have as well. And they're different motifs. These motifs are very central. Like some of them are very central to um, that have been documented are you know Orfa Aintab region. Uh, 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 Deir Zor has a sort of region up to Mardin. Um, some of them are the signs of the sun, which. You know, I met a woman in Huyuklu, which is near the border with Syria. She had this beautiful, I thought it was beautiful, uh, sun tattoo between her eyes. And, you know, it kind of attracts your eye. And she said, do you like my tattoo? And I said, yes, I like your tattoo. And she said, it's the sun. It's from pre-Islam, when we were all one. And I thought, wow. You know, like she's interpreting her tattoo. It's hers. She gets to interpret it. But then someone else is going to see it as this horrific uh, slave branding. And I talk about what I call, it's not my term, it's from Gemma Angel, who's a tattoo scholar. That is her real name. Gemma Angel talks about the loquaciousness of tattoos. Tattoos speak, they communicate. And so what was the purpose? You meet a woman who has a tattooed face. You encounter her. You know exactly who, what group she belongs to so that you do not you know, disturb that woman without getting the entire community after you. I mean, it's, 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 it communicates a form of belonging uh, between peoples that are tattooed, if, if you understand what I mean. So it's a really good question, because I think you nailed that, that kind of issue that lingers in the, the memory of tattoos. Um, Elise, thank you very much. Um, it's very moving. Um, sorry, I'm um, Amy Singer. I'm uh, in the Department of History at Brandeis University and an Ottoman historian. Um, like my colleague, um, to a certain extent, I found parts of your talk very, very disturbing, um, particularly the notion that our bodies absorb trauma that we didn't necessarily experience firsthand. I think many of us are in the throes of that right now. Um, and sometimes confused, uh, surprised that it should be so forceful. Um, and I think that there's a gender trauma now also that's extremely difficult. Um, so I had also, so I had a small question about the naming of the children, mm -hmm. and I wonder whether there are different fates for boy children and girl children mm -hmm. um, because we know about, um, at least anthropologically, that the value of boys, the value of girls, what the meaning of boy children and girl children mm -hmm. is. So I wondered if that's potentially, you know, one way of thinking about, <coughs> sorry, of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. But then the other is the tattoos. So. When you first started to talk about it, I wondered whether, um, it reminded me of the story in Anem, Anem in my grandmother, that um, that's told um, where she talks about how her grandmother recognized other women by the special breads that they all baked mm -hmm. around Easter, that that was like a sign mm -hmm. of recognition for them, that they all baked mm -hmm. these breads. And so I wonder whether the tattoos then become not only a mark of shame, but um, a sign that allows women to communicate a kind of solidarity of trauma and tragedy and suffering. Um, and even the scarring then, I mean, the scars are recognizable. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered um, whether you had anything to say about that. And then I just think that there's a kind of bigger context to think about the ways in which women's bodies, particularly their faces and hands, are um, marked and manipulated, not always by tattooing, sometimes by things that National Geographic photographs all the time and sort of holds out to a kind of Western audience that sees it as deformity or you know somehow disturbance, but which is actually a mark of puberty, a mark of beauty, a, and that women would be ashamed not to have, in a sense, yeah. um, because they are marks of belonging um, and acceptance 
as adults into the community. So um, I think that the whole, this is in and of itself something that creates a conversation among different cultures um, and the ways in which those things are used. That may not be the way your research will go, but I think that you probably have a lot to share with, um, with others um, on that. And then just finally, just a reference. There's a, a graphic history that was done by Rebecca Hall that's called Wake, which is her attempt to retrieve the memories of um, enslaved women, mm -hmm. enslaved African women who revolted. And so she goes searching for traces of this. Mm -hmm. And this graphic um, history memoir is both a mixture of her own experience mm -hmm. doing the research and experiencing this kind of disturbing of the sediments mm -hmm. and the history that she's able to retrieve and, and, and evoke th of women's activism mm -hmm. uh, and, and fighting back. Um, so I think that that could be a really interesting point of intersection with another conversation. Oh, definitely. Thank you. I mean, that's why I, I dabbled with autoethnography, which I don't think is typical to find in history writing because I wanted to in, insert myself in the history because I'm also trying to interpret. And, of course, I'm going to make mistakes as well. I actually... I found one at one point, um, and I realized it was my own mental kind of block that just didn't want to see what I was looking at. Um, so, okay, uh, you have so much in that comment, but I guess what I would say is there are certain tattoo practitioners, certain women who traveled in the communities and tattooed. Sometimes women did it themselves in their community, but oftentimes there's a practitioner. The formula for the ink itself is deeply symbolic. It's a breast milk from a woman who is nursing a daughter. It is a fertility ink. And a lot of the symbols are fertility as well. A lot of this got cut out of the book because there was 100 pages that needed to be removed. It was too long. But I learned a lot along the way. And what I also learned was that this information was not considered valuable enough for anyone to study it. I mean, because I wrote Lila Abolucha, and I was like, what, you work with tattooed women? What do we know about these tattoos? And, and my, the email response that I got was, wow, this is interesting, but I have not found, I was looking for anything written in Arabic and could not find it. I found a dissertation in Italian. Um, and so one of the foremost experts on this subject is Alberto Savioli, who wrote his dissertation in Italian, documented all the motifs in Eastern Syria, did not publish his dissertation. So I was thankful to him and Don Shati and others who helped me, um, who had worked with these communities um, to try to piece the information together. And I was very thankful for all these publications in Turkey. And now there's these young Kurdish women who are opening tattoo parlors in places like Lisbon, Portugal, um, places like Diyarbakir. Um, and women are taking pride in going and getting these tattoos because the motifs, well, I would say these are the open signification of tattoos, who knows what they mean to individual women, but we there is an attempt to kind of reassert um, this tradition. Um, perhaps women could identify which tattooist made the motifs. Um, certainly they can identify each other's embroidery and other things, uh, bread. Um, I'm trying to think of other elements of, of your comment, but I will definitely look up Wake, and, um, and yeah, thank you for, for all of those ideas. Lise, thank you so much. Uh, I have a couple of questions, if I can. Oh, introduce myself. Mark Mamagonian from Nasser up the road in Belmont. Uh, uh, did the practice of Armenians visiting, making pilgrimage or, or, or exploration of Derzor uh, change over the course of the decades from the 20s uh, through whenever it was that they were last able to go there. That was one question. The second question was, uh, I've forgotten what the second question was, so I'll go to the other second question, which is on, on the matter of tattoos. While it's evidently factually correct to say that these were not slavery tattoos, did the women themselves, have you? did you find that they interpreted them that way or that they conveyed to their 
families that this is how mm -hmm. they understood them, or is this an interpretation that was put on them and that the women internalized, and is it possible to even separate those? So that's, I'm going to start with the second question first, because what we do have is a lot of press, like press coverage that's describing them as slave brandings or slave tattoos. And I do argue that there are cases in which women were hastily tattooed in a way that shows that it's not really conforming to any of the motifs that we know in circulation. I believe we could call those slaving tattoos because slavers may have tat. It was easier to transport women around if they looked like the women of the region. When you were not tattooed in those areas, you stood out. That's why some women wanted to be tattooed. They knew their lives were endangered if they looked different than the communities they were living within. Um, so yeah, going to one particular case, there's Nargis Avakian, and her, I mean, it's a big newspaper clipping, you know, Armenian woman survives, you know, she's slave branding. Um, well, the doctors, and there's also doctor reports from New York City about her, um, you know, she was tattooed on her nose and it went through the cartilage. That is not, I've, I've consulted with tattooists, you don't do that, you ruin your tattoo when you actually go too deeply. And in some cases, and this is also true for some post memories, people remember their grandmother saying, he, he tattooed me with a barn nail. He tattooed you with a barn nail. That doesn't sound correct. This is a woman's practice. Why is a man tattooing? Why is he tattooing with a barn nail instead of a very fine bundle of needles, as is the tradition? So this is where consulting with tattooists became helpful for me to think about Nargis Avakian's case, I do believe she was, she was tattooed so that they could move her around more easily. And that's why her tattoos were frankly uneven on her face and the photographs that we have of her. I'm going to Derzor. There is change over time. And I think the most interesting change about the pilgrimage to Derzor that I document is how actually um, Peter Balakian's Bones essay in the New York Times Magazine brought this tradition that was largely regional to Levantine, um, well, I would say to Lebanese and Syrian Armenians, brought it to m Americans, and we have people creating and coordinating their own trips after uh, Peter's journey, and, um, and it happened in 20, 2008. He went again, I think, in 2010 and took 60 minutes, and it, it really brought, that's prosthetic memory right there. Peter Balakian took a regional practice and through, through P, really publicity and, and media, sort of mediated this, this phenomenon and transmitted it to um, Armenian Americans and Europeans who, who went um, before the war began. Okay, I think we have time for one or yeah. two questions. Maybe we can collect two questions. Okay. May I do one? Sorry that my answers are so long. No. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Is, is there someone who has a question? Yes. Uh, I, you mentioned practitioner, and you mentioned one gentleman that went and rescued women. Uh, last mm -hmm. time I was here, I was with Dr. Carl Russo, who put the War Victims Project together. In 94, I got a phone call from the United Nations looking for a Russian-speaking woman rape therapist to go into an active war where much of this was going on. And then next year, the State Department called me. I happen to be that. It's very humbling work, uh, mm -hmm. being a practitioner and going alone. But when you talk about Av Avakni, uh, I had a, sim a similar case. And um, the one thing you didn't talk about with the whole thing of scars and tattoos mm -hmm. is shame. And when I met with my staff, because I, I was the only American with a million and a half dollar budget, we do our cases. Mm -hmm. And what do we do with a woman that was so beautiful at the age of 14, that she was ruined, if you will. And before taking her into plastic surgery, I said, we're not gonna make her beautiful on the outside, that was her downfall, until we make her beautiful on the inside again. Yeah. Okay, so maybe this is a Zabel Yesayan report moment, oh, okay. right? Like, but. Uh, on this, okay, my question is about Ottoman history and your interventions to it in terms of not fetishizing the archive. Can you tell us a little bit more, maybe like two minutes mm -hmm. in total, and then we'll thank you. Yeah, I mean, I know this, this is the part that probably won't go over so well, but 
You know, I've been, I've been for my career trying to find little moments, much like that letter, you know, fragmentary moments in which I can hear a woman's voice over time. And I got so frustrated with it. And I also, um, I had all these questions that I couldn't ask living humans, you know. I decided to move, like you said in the introduction, to the modern period because I really do want to talk to people and their feelings about history or their memories about historical moments. Um, and it's not, that's not something I'm trained in. It's a place I came because the sediment got kicked up um, during the war. And of course the wars, because I think a lot of us are going through um, moments now where it's hard to do our work as usual because we're very distracted by the present um, so for years, I was working in earlier periods of documents. The Syrian National Archives researched under two different Assad administrations. They're basically one, but you know what I mean. And then, you know, some Ottoman documents as well, Tapu Tahrir documents and various things, Kanunami um, from the Ottoman archives and some cases here. But I just think there's limits to what the archive can do for us if we're trying to write this kind of history. Um, I hope that we can have a debate about that in the field. And, um, and I think a lot of us, and it's not like conditions in Turkey for researchers are all that wonderful either. It's, it's growing more difficult everywhere, right? So how do we do our work? How do we continue writing history and getting perhaps even more creative about it? And what I'm very excited about is cross-disciplinary conversations with people outside of the field of history. Uh, I read a lot of anthropologists who are doing history. I read a lot of historians that are also doing anthropology. I think right there, there's some synergy that we should work with. And then, of course, um, gender studies and women's studies, feminist studies is an interdisciplinary field. So I feel like it opens up to all of that possibility. Great. Thank you so much, Elise. This was great.